Assalamu alaikum, bismillahir rahmanir rahim, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala ashrif al anbiya'i wal mursaleen, Sayyidina wa Mawlana wa Habibina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa ala alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam tasliman kathira. Welcome uh, all of you to the fourth session of Purification of the Heart. Alhamdulillah, um, we are going to go ahead and maximize our time as much as possible and jump right into the uh, first part, which is the review, right? We do a bit of a review, um, and I do that by actually asking you guys some questions. I'm hoping that you remembered what we covered last session on Tuesday, uh, and I'll go ahead and ask you, who can tell me, and remember, these answers are coming to me only, okay? So I'm the one that is able to see exactly uh, who is providing the answers, and I will list off the, um, the answers as they come in and uh, make sure to recognize, uh, you know, the order so that those of you who are, you know, doing what we should be doing. Ghibta, remember we talked about Ghibta, which is uh, competing for good. It's a good thing to do. So I like healthy competition, and I'd like to see you guys jumping into the chat box and answering right away. So the very first question is, this is a disease of the heart that prevents you from speaking up from acting when you should. If you see something unjust or you have a question about something, you get, you know, you're, you're, you don't have the courage to speak up. What is that called? Very good. So mashallah, Ayman and Uthman, I don't know which of you answered. Maybe you guys can uh, put A or O first. Uh, so that way I know who to uh, address. But great job. You guys answered first, mashallah. And oh, Ayman, you came back with the... Um, with the Arabic as well, Hayad Damim, very good. So blameworthy modesty or Hayad Damim is the modesty that prevents you. It's being shy, but not in the shyness that's good, right? We have shyness and shyness is a beautiful quality. The Prophet ﷺ was shy. And it's a wonderful quality for us to have, but blameworthy modesty is when the shyness actually prevents you from doing the right thing right? And the right thing is making sure that if something's not clear that you're being taught, that you get clarity because you don't want to walk away confused. Or if you see something bad happening in front of you, that you speak up and you say, hey, that's not right. And I'm going to defend or speak out against this thing. So good job. All right. Um, you guys are not going to be able to see the answers because the chat box is not open to everyone. Okay. We are controlling the uh, room for many reasons, but primarily for security reasons. Okay. So the answers are coming to me and I'm seeing them. So don't worry about your friends uh, or other people seeing your answers. I'm seeing them and I will make sure to acknowledge who is saying what. Okay. All right. So good job. So the next um, question I'm going to ask you is, let's see here, I got to look up my presentation. Um, how many thoughts roughly do we have every day, if you can give me the range, and tell me about how many of them are negative? I know this is a big one, right? Um, and how many of them are repeat thoughts from the previous day? So first question was, how many overall thoughts can we have? What's like the maximum, that, that number? I gave you two numbers. I said anywhere between this number and this number of thoughts every day people have on average. Who can remember? Oh, Mariam, mashallah, excellent. You came right in with the full range. So people can have anywhere from 12,000 to 60,000 thoughts a day. Excellent job, Mariam and Zakaria, mashallah. You came in answering 95% are repeated thoughts, excellent. And you also said, Zakaria, uh, that 80% are negative. So great job. You distinguished between the two, which is so important. So when, I, when we're asking questions, make sure to be clear, right, in your response. So Zakaria actually wrote 80% negative, 95% repeated. Awesome. That's the kind of uh, focus that I want to see attention, right, that you're paying attention to the question I'm asking you and your answer reflects that. Because if you just give me a number, I'm not sure what you're an answering, right? And um, I'm making it a little bit challenging because I don't want it to be too simple. I know some of you are, mashallah, too quick, and I, I got to give you a challenge. Otherwise, it's not going to be fun, right? So great job on answering that question. All right. Um, let's see here. Hmm. What other question can I ask you? Okay. This is again, I'm, I'm, I'm getting a little tougher with my questions because I see that you guys are too sharp, mashallah. 
this is the treatment for uh, or the treatment for this particular disease of the heart is to know the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, okay? And if we study the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it helps to control something. It helps to control this particular disease. Who can tell me what the disease is in English and Arabic? One answer. So it's, I want the full uh, answer in English and Arabic. And they, this, by the way, is not is from last week's or on Tuesday's session. So we're only focusing on those three diseases of the heart that we covered on Tuesday. Some of you are giving me answers from far uh, back, but nope, uh, we're looking at again uh, thoughts. For, I mean, excuse me, uh, the last three sessions. So let's hear. I have oh, mashallah, Afnan, excellent, Afnan. You came through. You gave me exactly what I wanted. You gave me the English. And then you gave me the Arabic. Excellent. The disease of the heart that is treated by studying the 99 names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is called blameworthy thoughts in English, khawd fi mala ya'ni, right? Which is um, blameworthy thoughts in Arabic. So Afnan gave me both answers. Awesome. Great job. Afnan, next time, just to, for your sake, because I don't want anybody to beat you to it, try to type them all in one answer because you gave them to me separate, but I want you to do it fast but do it also consolidated okay so that way you get boom both of them in great job so khawd fima la'yani is uh, is when you have thoughts that are blameworthy uh, you shouldn't have them and a way to control your thoughts is to one of the treatments is to remember the 99 names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala very good okay um let's look um, this uh, is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said will clean and purify um, our wealth. What is the thing that cleans and purifies our wealth? It's something that we all do. Very good, Zakaria and Zoya and Dania, mashallah. Both of you answered correct answers. Zakaria, you came with sadaqah, which is awesome. And then uh, uh, Zoya and Dania, you guys came with zakat. So both of those aren't correct uh, answers, right? Sadaqah and charity is both giving. So that's why you both got a great job. And um, that we covered under what? We covered under which disease of the heart when we talked about the importance of charity, right? Uh, and the Prophet ﷺ, he actually said that uh, contentment is a treasure that is never exhausted he was speaking really about being in a state of gratitude. And when you're in a state of gratitude, it helps to protect from this particular disease of the heart. Again, we're talking about the ones we covered on Tuesday. So which hadith or which um, disease of the heart was that in reference to? Very good, Amen and Uthman, you guys got it, mashallah, excellent job. Fear of poverty, khawf al-faqar, very good. So when you're afraid of being poor or becoming poor, it's a disease of the heart. And the way to treat that disease of the heart is to increase in your gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're uh, showing your gratitude and you're content. When you have contentment, rida, it means you're very happy with whatever Allah gave you. So that's one of the ways. Awesome. Okay, you guys, you did fantastic. May Allah reward all of you. Very proud of you guys. You all did great. So we're going to go ahead and move on to today's lesson. Okay, let me quickly pull, um, do the screen share and hopefully we'll get this going right away. Inshallah, I'm going to present. Just give me a minute, present, and here we go. Okay, so uh, also let me open up the, cute, the chat box so that I can see what you guys are saying. All right, whoa, uh-oh, there we go. Um, let me drag you over here. So hopefully you guys can see everything, right? So here we go. We are beginning week two. This is the second week Thursday's lesson. So let's start with a quick summary of the disease of the heart that we've covered this week, okay? So remember, Tuesday we did blameworthy modesty, blameworthy, blameworthy thoughts, fear of poverty. Today I said we're gonna go over the next four. We have ostentation, which is riya. We have relying on other than God. We have displeasure with divine decree. And we have seeking reputation, suma. So this is what we're going to cover today, okay? So let's go ahead and start. So ostentation, okay? This is a very, I know it's a big word. It's kind of like, huh, Austin, what? 
Ostentation, okay? Everybody should say it. If you're home, just say it to yourself. Ostentation. What is ostentation? This is, the Arabic of it is riyah. This is when you show off or you, you're doing things to get attention and praise from other people and not for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, okay? Um, it's dangerous because it means that you care more about uh, uh, people and what they think about you than you do about pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So ostentation, right? Um, and this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that in the Quran that everything we do will be rewarded appropriately, okay? And that means according to our intention. So whatever your intention is, then Allah will reward you. And so there's a hadith, a famous hadith, where there's three people that in this dunya, they achieved things and they did things because they, they made a claim. They said it was for the pleasure of Allah. But on the day of judgment, Allah reminds them, no, you didn't do it for me. So the first person is the knowledgeable person who went and you know became very knowledgeable. And they said that they did that for the sake of Allah. But Allah tells them on the day of judgment, no, you went and got knowledge so that people could call you uh, the most knowledgeable and, and, and praise you for your knowledge, right? It wasn't for my sake. Uh, the other person is a wealthy person who gives you know, their money for, they say they're doing it for the sake of Allah, but Allah really knows what's in their heart. And he reminds them and he says on the day of judgment, no, you didn't give money for my sake. You gave it so that people could say about you, you were so generous, such a generous man that man was. And so Allah tells them on the day of judgment, you get the reward for what you did. Jaza'un wifaqa. That means that you get your, this is your, you already got your reward. You did it for the praise. So you got the praise, right? And then the last uh, uh, category is a man who goes to jihad, right? They fight for the, in, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a war and they die saying that they did it for the sake of Allah. But Allah reminds them, no, you did it so that you could be treated, you know, hailed a hero. Like, oh, what a heroic man he was. He fought with such valor and strength. You did it so people could praise you. And that's the reward you already got because people praised you. So you got your reward. So ostentation is really dangerous because if your intention isn't for the sake of Allah, then this is what happens is you actually end up losing the reward of what you're doing. Uh, and whatever your intention was, that's going to be what your reward is. You won't get the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? So um, that's why we have to remember. And yes, thank you. As Taslim says, this is why we're taught in Namal A'malu bin Niyat, right? That every single thing that we do is based on our intentions. So if our intentions aren't right, we are not going to, uh, we're going to get whatever our intentions are. And that's why it's so important to always make sure your intention is for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, so let's look uh, more at this disease of the heart. So, um, Riyah is so dangerous that the Prophet ﷺ actually gave it a special name, okay? So this hadith, he said, Indeed, the thing that I fear for you the most is the minor shirk, which is associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, okay? So when we associate partners, that means we say that Allah has, you know, help, like he's got helpers. Um, and people, you know, who have uh, the wrong idea about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say certain things about who those helpers are. We, of course, Allah does need, needs no help. Uh, he has no helpers. He is one, right? That's a very big part of being a Muslim. So he's saying here that he he's, uh, fears for us the minor form of shirk. So that his companions were like, wait, what? What's the minor shirk? Because they understood that shirk was just saying that Allah has partners, he, they didn't know what, what a small, minor means small, right? Major is big, minor is small. So they were like, what's minor shir shirk? And he said, riyah, riyah, showing off. So there's two forms of shirk. There's one which is saying that Allah actually has partners. And then the other is, is doing things for other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Whenever we do anything that is not for the sake of Allah and we're doing it for the pleasure of other people, then it's kind of like we're making those people partners with Allah, right? It's not the same as worshiping them, but it is making them so important that we start doing things for uh, their pleasure instead of looking at the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, okay? 
So, and I see some questions, you guys. I will get to your questions, but we'll have to wait till the end. So don't exhaust yourselves right now typing too much about the questions. Wait, save them and, and uh, wait for the end, okay? So in another hadith, uh, this is actually a really good hadith because it's giving you an example. Uh, the Prophet gave the example of someone who is making the adhan, right? And while making the adhan, they think, wow, I bet the people think that my voice is beautiful, right? And so that is an example of riya, right? And another hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said that riya is so dangerous, it's sneaky, that it's like the black ant on the black rock in the night with no moon, right? It can sneak up on you like this. So you have to pay so much attention to your intentions. Otherwise, these thoughts will come inside your heart. Like, let's say, you know, you're at the masjid and you're, you're taking a class, right, with a teacher. And then the teacher looks at you and says, if you're like, if you're an older boy, let's say you're a teenage boy, 15 years old, and the teacher looks to you and says, Ahmed, I want you to lead the prayer today. Okay, it's Maghrib prayer and you have to lead it. And you're like, what? Me? And the teacher says, yeah. And you know, alhamdulillah, you know Qur'an, you've been studying it. And then as soon as he tells you to do that, you kind of get this thought in your head. Oh, wow, I'm going to get to now recite in front of everybody. I'm going to, you know, get on the microphone and the whole masjid is going to hear my voice. Wow, everybody's going to think I'm such a good reciter of Qur'an. That is riya. It's entering your heart. It makes you want to kind of show off, right? So you want to be very careful because if you're ever asked to do something like that, it's a responsibility, right? To lead people in prayer is a huge responsibility. So it should kind of be heavy on your heart, not like, ooh, I can't wait to show off, right? And that's not how you look at it, okay? So let's look at this. I like this example of the ant, okay? So if you look on the left, okay, I have this ant. It's in broad daylight, right? You can see ants when they're in day, can't you? Um, you can see them. If they come on your counters in the kitchen or if you're walking even on the sidewalk, you'll see a trail of ants in the daytime. But if it's nighttime, if it's super dark, right, and the, you know, the, there's no moon out, um, and you, let's say you're sitting outside, if you've ever gone camping or you're just kind of in nature, if you're sitting somewhere and you, there's not a whole lot of light, right, then if an ant comes up on you or a trail of ants, you might not see it at all, right? That's why the analogy is important to kind of reflect on, that you, if you're not paying attention, th this, uh, this disease of the heart can creep up on you just like an ant that's in that's dark itself it's a black ant on a black rock in the middle of the night can sneak up on you so think about that whenever you have anything uh, that you have to do always question your intentions ask yourself why am i really doing this is it really because i want allah to be happy with me or is it because i want people to praise me and compliment me and make me feel special and i want to make I want to look my I look at myself better, right, than other people. Or I want, uh, you know, I want, excuse me, I want other people to look at me as though I'm better, maybe better than my cousins or my siblings or my best friends or my classmates. I want my teachers to think I'm better than them. This is Riya. So we have to be so careful. Okay, very important thing. All right, so next um, we're going to talk about the treatment. So how do you get rid of this? Well, the treatment that Imam al-Mawlud talks about in Purification of the Heart is that you should increase your hidden good deeds. So the things that you're doing in private, you should start increasing those deeds. Like if you, let's say for example, you feel like really grateful to Allah. Like some, maybe you're lying in bed and you're like, Ya Allah, thank you so much for giving me my family and my home and this life that I have. You know, I, there's so many people that don't have a home. They don't even have their parents. Even the Prophet he didn't know his parents, right? I mean, he barely knew his mother. He never met his father. His mother passed when he was six years old. So there's so many kids your age who don't have what you have. A lot of them have been through really difficult times. So if you ever feel that great sense of gratitude, right? Um, the next day, for example, you could come and go, mom, dad, you know, last night I was in bed and I felt so much gratitude to Allah and I just was praising him. And I was, you know, you start sharing what you did, right? And what you felt. You could do that. And then you and you could say, I'm going to go and pray to rakat and, you know, you know, do this. Or I'm going to go give sadaqah. You want to do something, right? To show your great gratitude to Allah. 
you could do that in front of everybody, in front of your brothers and sisters and everybody listening. Or you could say, this feeling I have is for Allah. It really is. And I don't need to share it with everybody. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to maybe when everybody goes to sleep or you know, right before Fajr, if I can wake up, because now most, if you guys are waking up a little bit early for suhoor with your families, then maybe you go and you wake up a little early and you pray, you make wudu, and then you go to a private place in the house and you just pray your two rakah and you have your moment with Allah and you don't really need to share it with other people. You don't need to come the next day and broadcast, right? Broadcasting is like announcement, everybody. I just prayed two rakah or I prayed 20 rakah or I did a thousand dhikr. You, know, you don't need to do that because when it's truly for Allah, he already knows, he, he sees it. He knew that you were gonna do it before you even thought of the idea. So you just have to be happy that Alhamdulillah, Allah knows that I did this for him and not worry about what mom says, what dad says, what your brothers and sisters think of you or your teachers. You know, you don't come the next day to school and report it to your teachers. Oh, guess what I did? You know, just keep those things hidden. So you wanna increase your hidden actions because that will make you less likely that you have this disease of the heart, Ria. And then here is, you know, uh, an example of the Prophet I'm actually making dua for protection from Ria because it's such a sneaky disease that all of us, we have to be so careful of getting, right? Even he made dua for it, subhanAllah. Because back before, um, you know, there, before Islam, the uh, Quraysh, the people of Mecca, they used to make Hajj. But in that time, it's called the period of Jahiliya. It's called the period of ignorance. They didn't know they weren't Muslim. What they would do is when they would make the Hajj, because remember the Hajj was, you know, uh, in honor of Prophet Ibrahim salam, and Ismail salam, they created the Kaaba. So they were a lot of the people in that time, they would still do the, the Hajj to honor them, right? So when they would do it, they would be very arrogant about it. And they would make it a big show, like, I am going to go do the Hajj. And they would, you know, kind of brag about it. So the Prophet Sallallahu did not want to do anything like those people. So he actually here, he asked, oh Allah, I intend to perform Hajj. Uh, please free, free me from ostentation and seeking fame. Like, I don't, I'm not doing it so that people can say, oh, I made Hajj, you know. I'm doing it for you. But he himself would make dua that Allah protects him from that. So we should certainly make dua that we, um, that Allah removes that from our heart, that we don't do things to show off, okay? So that's the treatment for uh, ostentation. And of course, we should be humble and always know that whatever we're doing is, uh, is because of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He loves us and he's drawing us closer to him. And he doesn't like arrogance. Those things are not good to have showing off. He doesn't like those qualities. He loves humility, right? And he loves things that are done in hidden secret for his sake. So increase your good deeds that way, all right? So the next disease of the heart, this is, right? Yatawakkal ala ghayr Allah, which is relying on other than God. So this is a disease of the heart because if you get too used to relying on people you can easily forget that Allah is the one that he is the one who gives you every good deed right or every good thing excuse me every blessing you have is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even if it comes through your parents your grandparents your teachers your you know aunts uncles whoever if you recognize or if you always remember that all good deeds no matter what come from Allah then you learn to also put your focus back whenever you have a need you go back to Allah. You don't go to people with your needs, right? So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, he says, do not call unto any beings other than Allah. These are, uh, these are capable of neither benefit nor harm, right? So anybody else other than Allah, they are not capable of benefiting you or harming you, right? It's just don't go to them, right? To do so is therefore a guilt is uh, guilty of wrongdoing. When Allah afflicts you with something, no one can remove it except him. So basically, this ayah is telling us, turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for everything, right? Uh, for good, when you need something, and when you're being tested, go to him for help. Don't go to people, because people can't benefit you or harm you, right? And then he also says here, seek your livelihood from him and worship him alone. Reminding us again, don't go to people 
for your needs, but only go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, okay? So this is an important point because one of the things that Muslims don't do is beg, okay? We believers don't beg people. When we have a need, whatever that need is, we go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first and we ask Allah for help. Ya Allah, you know, maybe you're worried, for example, about money or you're worried about your health or you're worried about your someone you love, right? And that you, um, you know, you, you, you want protection from them, that Allah protects them from harm. So if you have some need that's heavy on your heart, you go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first and foremost, and you ask him, please help me, help my parents, help my loved ones. And you make those du'as. Very important to always do that first. Then, of course, you can look to see in your life if there is a place that you can go to seek help. Because begging and seeking help are not the same thing. Begging is, and we'll talk about the difference, uh, right? But begging is, is where you... Uh, you're not asking Allah for help at all. You're just turning to someone and saying, please, please, please give something to me, right? That's not the same as actually looking to places or people that are there to help you, right? So there's people, for example, in our community, excuse me, some of them have a hard time with making enough money to pay for rent and food and clothes. And so that's why we have zakat, right? We have zakat through the masjid because we are supposed to look out for each other. Allah gives to some people more than he gives other people. So th those of us, alhamdulillah, who he's given a lot to, the, our job is to... So that's why... Path, right and it's sister Jose your video has paused um so let's wait just one minute, everybody. Sister Husayi will be back up. Uh, it just is a little bit of an um, internet issue. It will be resolved. Zakallah. Apologize uh, for that, but I was saying that we don't beg in Islam because begging a lot of times people who beg what happens is people can be so cruel and they end up humiliating them. They kick them out. They spit on them. They kick them. And this is Allah doesn't want that for us. He doesn't want us to ever be treated that way. Right. And so we uh, he tells us not to beg because we should have an honor in the way that we, uh, we conduct ourselves. And so if we need help, we turn to the masjid, we turn to different places that offer support and services, hospitals, clinics, if we need certain things. Um, and we, we get help, right? But we do not uh, beg. And here, look at the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi what he says here at the bottom. He says, by the one in whose hand my life is, right? He's talking about Allah. It is better for one of you to take a rope and carry firewood on his back than for him to go to someone and beg who will either give him or refuse to give him anything. So here the problem system is doing the same thing. He's protecting us. He says, go get rope, go get some firewood and sell that. That's better for you. Even though it's heavy labor to go get rope and collect firewood, chop down wood, you know, you might get splinters, you might cut yourself, but he's saying that's better. It's better to work hard and earn your money than to go and beg other people, right? Who can either give you something or may not, and may actually end up humiliating you and refusing you. So he's also protecting the honor, uh, our honor by telling us this. So let's talk about this a little bit more. Look at these people, right? I like this example of carrying um, the, the back, right? Because it's showing you that working for our needs is more pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Even if it's difficult, right? Uh, because we're putting our trust in him and we're not making it difficult for others. When you go and beg someone else, 
you're actually putting that person in an awkward situation too. Cause it's like, Oh, okay, sure. Here, I'll give you my money. What if I needed the money? Right? What if I was, what if I had like $10 in my pocket and I needed it to go buy something important, but now that you've put me on the spot, I feel weird and I have to give you my money and all because you didn't want to work for it. Right? So when you work for it, and you actually are willing to do something as strenuous as taking firewood on your back. And look at this lady in the middle picture, right? This, she's probably an older woman, but this is what people of, you know, belief and, and integrity and they, you know, have strong work. I think is when you have something, right? Which is very important in Islam. Um, they'll, they're willing to work uh, even into their 70s and 80s. You see some people, mashallah, working because they don't ever want to beg people. So you have people all throughout the world, they understand this. We should understand it too. And begging, right, is making it easy for yourself, but you're making it hard for other people. And that's why it's discouraged. So we don't turn to people for our needs. We go directly to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, okay? And so I hope that's clear. This is the part of relying on other than Allah, right? So the treatment for this is get in the habit of first and foremost, if you have any need whatsoever, um, to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And sometimes people think like, oh, you know, as a kid, let's say, what are your needs? You know, maybe you want to go to some vacation, you're excited about summer break because you want to go somewhere. That's a want, right? You have to know the difference between want and need. But even those wants, if you really, really want something, you go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and ask him for it, right? My boys, for example, they love Legos. They could do Legos all day long. And so, uh, you know, if they really, really want Legos, they should then go to Allah and say, Ya Allah, please put it in my parents' heart to get me this Lego set that I want. Please, Ya Allah. And maybe something will happen. Maybe, uh, you know, their parents might not uh, necessarily get it for them. Maybe their grandparents will surprise them with an Eid gift or, or a birthday gift. This happens all the time, right? Where a child or someone will really want something, but that if you turn that want into a dua and you go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you start to realize that all good, everything that you ever want is always from Allah anyway, no matter who it comes through. So why even bother asking a person about it? I'll just ask Allah for it and he will inshallah find a way to get it to me. So always do that first, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first. And then the other thing is also to start to lower your expectations from people. Because to be honest, as an adult, you know, you, most of you are young, you'll see that a lot of people are gonna disappoint you in life, right? And it's just natural because not everybody can always think about everybody else. So what happens is sometimes, you know, people are there for you. Sometimes they're not. Sometimes you call your friend or your sister or your cousin or your brother and you say, hey, I need help. And they go, sorry, I'm doing something else. I have my own family. I have my own obligations. And it gets kind of hard to hear that all the time. But if you stop asking, right, for people, you stop turning to people and you just start becoming more self-sufficient, which is, you know what? I'm going to just start learning to do things on my own because it makes me not depend on people. And I'll also ask Allah for help. Like Allah, send me the helpers. You know, I am not going to bother other people. I need help, but I'm going to rely on you to bring me that help, right? This is a show of great Iman. And so we should get in the habit of doing that as opposed to depending too much on other people and then dealing with disappointment and dealing with, you know, so many problems that come when someone says to you, uh, for example, I'll be there. Let, let's say you, you're moving. I mean, this happens to people, you know, and you have to move your whole house, okay? Packing up your boxes and lifting up heavy furniture by yourself isn't easy, right? So there's sometimes people who've called up their friends and you know whoever, and they say, hey, can you help me? I need to help. And then they're like, sure, I'll be there. But then moving day comes along and all of a sudden, uh-oh, there's nobody, like two people show up or not even maybe one person shows up out of all these people you called and everybody's texting you that day or calling you the night before, sorry, I have to go somewhere else and I didn't even know and I had an appointment and my mom needed this. And so now you're sitting by yourself going, I rented a moving truck and I don't, I don't have any help and it just gets really hard, right? But if you start saying, I'm not gonna do that, rather, Ya Allah, 
give me the means and the ability to just get things done, then you can maybe uh, hire someone or, you know, someone that when you pay people, it's a little different, right? People will show up. But, uh, but the point is, is Allah will open an opportunity or a way for you to get what you need because you use the means that he gave you. If he gave you wealth, you can, like I said, call up a service and ask them to help. Um, or he can maybe, you know, send someone your way that is also in need uh, of work. And now you're both helping each other out, right? So Allah will do that for you, inshallah, but turn to him first. This is how you treat this disease of the heart of relying too much on other people. Okay, inshallah. So alhamdulillah, I hope uh, you guys are, is everything clear? And quickly check the Q&A, make sure there's no issues with my screen or anything or my volume, right? It's good, right? All right, so let us, um, bismillah, go to the next one. So, sakhat al-qadr, this is a displeasure with divine decree. All right, this disease is when you cannot accept when something happens or has already happened and you keep thinking, why, why me? Why did this have to happen to me? Okay, so let's say for example, you lose your wallet, okay? Or you break your iPad or your phone. You're playing and then boom, it crashes. Or an accident happens and your brother does it or your sister does it. They break your toy. Okay, very easy to let your nafs react and get mad. That's a normal response, okay? And we're all going to do that in our lives until we learn better, right? So it's okay to do that because you're a human being and you're reacting. But when you think back after your emotions calm down a little bit, if you keep thinking, why did that have to happen? Why, why, why? And you keep going like just over and over whatever it was, and it replays in your mind and it really bothers you that it happened, this is when this disease of the heart is manifesting, right? It's coming out. Because if something, if Allah, if something already happens and Allah decreed it to happen, which means it's his will, then you just have to accept it, right? Because we don't always know what's good for us and what's not good for us. That's really the bottom line. We really don't. And that's why this ayah in the Quran says what it may be that you dislike something though it is good for you and it may be that you love something though it is bad for you and god knows and you do not know okay so this is a really good uh time to just kind of talk about this because as you guys grow up in life you're gonna have to do certain things that you might not want to do because you think you know you're looking at it from a physical or material perspective. For example, let's just say medicine, okay? There's some medicines that are bitter, all right? Um, and when you think of even taking them, you're like, oh gosh, it's so disgusting. I don't want to put it in my mouth. I'm going to throw up and and you're just making it seem like it's the worst thing in the world. But that medicine is healing for you. So if you take the medicine, it's going to help you some way or another, right? That's there's certain things that Allah's made in this dunya like that, that they're not, they don't sound good. They don't taste good. Your nafs isn't going to like it, but in actuality, it's really good for you. The opposite is also true. For example, uh, there's certain things that if you eat too much of it, it will have the opposite effect, but the nafs almost pushes you to do that. How many of you have ever eaten way too much sweets? right? Because it was so good. Whether it was ice cream or it was candy or it was cookies or it was birthday cake, right? You've eaten something because you're like, oh my God, that looks so delicious. It's and you end up feeling sick. Your nafs is telling you, keep eating it. Your taste buds are like, oh, ding, 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 because the sugar and so keep eating it, but then unfortunately what happens? Give it 10, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, and boom, that stomach ache comes in and the stomach ache causes so much pain, right? Um, sorry, did you guys hear what I said? I'm getting messages that it froze again. I don't know what's up with my internet today. I'm so sorry. I was talking about the ayah that says it may be that you dislike something though it's good for you 
And it may be that you love something though it's bad for you and you don't really know, Allah is the one that knows. So the example we gave was about medicine that's bitter but really good for you or candy and sweets that's good and tastes good but too much of it is bad for you. And sugar, just generally speaking, can cause a lot of inflammation and problems in the body. So when we eat it, we have to be controlled in how we eat it. Otherwise, it's a lot of problems, right? So this is how the world is generally. There's going to be a lot of things that are not always pleasant to do, but it's good for you. Even fasting. Some people are not that happy fasting because it's like, oh man, I can't have my cereal in the morning or my coffee. And, you know, they kind of get caught up in all the things that they can't do. And they forget that fasting is amazing for your body. Your body is like this machine. And when you fast, it helps to heal itself. There's all this repair happening, right? So fasting is incredible. But yeah, if you're letting your nafs uh, you know, think about fasting, it's not going to like it very much. So Allah knows better. So when he tells us to fast, that's why we fast, because he knows what's better for us. And so when we, if something happens, we have to just accept that our Lord knows better, and we have to be happy with whatever he wills for us, right? Willed for us, if it's in the past. Uh, obviously, thinking of the future, this is different because it hasn't happened yet. So you can make dua like, oh, Allah, protect me from this and don't let this happen to me. We don't want, obviously, bad things to happen. But if certain bad things happen already, then you have to be willing to let go instead of letting shaitan make you replay it over and over again with why, 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 right? That's what we're talking about. And so another really important point to hear is to know that all people in the world are in four different situations at any given time. And sometimes you can be in more than one of them at the same time. But let's look at, let's understand this. The first is that you're in blessing, okay? So if you're in blessing, that means everything's kind of going great for you. You have, alhamdulillah, family, you have money, you have education, you have a lot of good things in life and things are pretty good, right? Alhamdulillah, you have a lot to be grateful for. So what Allah expects from you, if you're in that state of blessing, is that you continue to be grateful, right? That you're continuously, Alhamdulillah, thank you, Allah. And you are show, you're using those blessings for good. So if he's giving you wealth and money, that you help people in need. If he's giving you knowledge, you teach people. If he's giving you a skill or a talent, you do it for good, right? You use that talent for the good of humanity. You don't use it to destroy uh, people and to cause harm to people, right? That is how we express our gratitude to Allah. The second is that you're in a state of bala or tribulation, which means that that you're being tested, that there's some difficulty that you have. It can be with wealth, it can be with your relationships, you know, it can be with your health, but there is a problem that Allah is testing you in, and what is he expecting from you is patience. Are you going to be patient with me because you're going through this difficulty, or are you going to react and be, you know, not happy? And this is what displeasure of the divine decree is because sometimes people are tested and they have a hard time accepting Allah's will. And then shaitan comes along and says, yeah. And they start, you know, put, he, he starts putting all these bad thoughts in your heart and it can cause problems. But when people have the right understanding, then they know that when they're being tested, like Prophet Ayub alayhi salam, right? He was tested. He lost all of his children. He got very sick. He lost his home. He lost everything. Everything, everything, everything. And though he responded with what? Sabrun Jamil, beautiful patience, right? So did uh, Prophet Yaqub, right? With when his son Yusuf was taken from him. These stories that we learn about the prophets teach us about beautiful patience. Even the Prophet Sallallahu himself, look at his life. As we said, he didn't know his uh, father. He lost his mother. He lost his grandfather, his uncle. He buried his, his beloved wife, his first wife, Khadija radiallahu anha, or the mother of the believers. He lost her. And then he lost five of his six children. He had to bury them himself. And he went through famine where he was, you know, he, him and the Muslims were starving. They were persecuted. There was so much that done to them. 
But through all of it, did he ever complain? Did he ever say, why me? I'm the prophet of God. Why are you doing this to me, Allah? Audhu billah, never, never would he ever say those words because he had so much iman in Allah and he understood that everything, even the hardships are always good because we don't know what's good for us, right? So beautiful patience is the response. The third is if you're guided. Alhamdulillah, we have guidance. We're Muslim. Allah loves us. He's drawing us close to him. And so we have to know, though, that though we are praying and we're fasting, we should never let arrogance enter our heart and become self-righteous. When you're self-righteous, you start looking at yourself as better than everybody else. So that's the response that is expected of you. If you have guidance, Allah wants you to realize that it's from him and not to become arrogant with that guidance. Don't think you're better than people, even non-Muslims. You don't go around treating people like your neighbors or people in public like you are better just because you're Muslim, you wear hijab and you fast or you have a beard. None of that matters. What matters is the heart. The heart. Only known to Allah. So, hello? Sister Husay, you froze just for a minute. There okay. you're right now. Yeah, my internet is not supporting us today, unfortunately. Maybe right. if you have two or three people uh, attending the session right now, maybe one of them can log off and that will Oh, she, you know, that's a good point. Um, Yasin or Ismail, I'm going to ask one of you guys to get off of the iPad. Okay, get off and share because uh, it's possible that too many people are using the uh, internet in this house and we're weakening the, the signal. Okay, so get off of it, please. All right, so... If you're again in guidance, um, what, is, what does that mean? It means that you should be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because as we said, there are people who may be drinking alcohol today, but maybe in five, 10 years from now, they've made tawbah and, and they're now hufal of Quran. Maybe they've become a half of the Quran. How do you know? You don't know what their future is. So you always want to look at everybody as, you know what? Not my place to judge. I'm just going to be a good person and do what I'm taught by the Prophet ﷺ, which is always want good for people, want guidance for people, instead of thinking I'm better than anybody, right? And then the last uh, disease of the heart, or I'm sorry, the last state, excuse me, I'm getting so many messages, my, my brain is, ah, okay. So the last state that people can be in is disobedience, right? And so people fall and they fall by, by, you know, not uh, doing what they're supposed to do, right? They make mistakes. That's another way of saying they're making mistakes. So people sin, they don't do sometimes what they're supposed to do. And if that happens, then the response is to keep going back to Allah, to make tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness. That's the, the response that you should have. So anytime you make a mistake, don't think like, oh, I'm so terrible. Allah will never forgive me. Never think that. That's from shaitan because he wants you to, to flee away from Allah because, you know, he's making you feel bad about yourself. Rather, just think Allah is the most forgiving. And like he says, even if your sins are like the, you know, the foam of the ocean or they reach the sky, keep coming back. Because the more we come back to Allah, he will, uh, you know, the better it is for us because we're, we're showing him that we love him and that we know he's so forgiving. And so that is the response of someone who's in that state of disobedience. So, so it's, again, so important to remember if Allah wills something, you let go, okay? And so the treatment, again, of, div of having this is that you remember that really Allah subhanahu is the only one that knows what's good for us. We do not know, Right. And then to reflect on the life of the Prophet Sallallahu think about how much he endured all the things we talked about. He lost so much, but he never ever complained ever about any of it. Not even once he understood that all of it was from Allah and he accepted, accepted it. And then also remember that whatever happened to you, whatever the thing was that you're not happy about, it could always be worse, right? Um, and, or it could, you know, it, alhamdulillah that it happened in, in, in some material thing, right? It was like a thing that you could replace. You can replace a bike, you can replace a phone, you can replace things like that. 
um, and it wasn't in your deen because having a, a problem in your deen is far worse, right? So if Allah is testing you in a material thing, not a big deal, right? So we just are grateful that alhamdulillah it's in that and nothing else. And then that it's in this world and not the next world because we don't want to be tested in the next world, right? We always ask Allah for protection from that, you know, from any punishments in the next life rather for whatever mistakes we've done or things that might have that aren't good let us you know deal with those things in this dunya instead of the next life so this is how we treat this particular disease of the heart okay and now we're going to in the oh wow we got to uh, speed it up because i want to answer your questions so seeking reputation suma is the last disease we're going to cover today we did four usually we've been doing three but we're going to try to squeeze in this four and if we go over a few minutes it's okay inshallah i hope your parents are okay with that but seeking reputation this is a really important one because you guys are growing up in a time where social media is everywhere okay you see a lot of people even young kids your age or younger there's people who have YouTube pages and Instagram pages and TikTok and Snapchat and Twitter and Facebook, they're everywhere. And what's happening to them? They're getting very, very famous and they're making a lot of money. So a lot of kids tend to think, ooh, that sounds so cool. I want to be like them too. I want to be famous. I want to be known. But it's a disease of the heart to ever want to be known to people um, and to, to start sharing your talents and good deeds and bragging about your what you do, that's a disease of the heart, okay? And so we have to be very careful um, about letting that, just because, again, it's something that we're seeing everywhere, that we end up also falling into this behavior. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one who exalts people, exalts bringing people up, right? Making them special. So Allah is the one, He's you exalt whomever you will, only Allah does it. And you debase whomever you will, debase is the opposite. So if he, exalting is to make someone important and, and you know, give them that, that status, to debase is to lower them and humiliate them. That's only in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's the only one who can do that, right? Um, indeed, you have power over all things. So we recognize that we shouldn't look for reputation or fame in, with people, though it's, it's pointless. And we're going to talk more about that in a second. But also here's the hadith, whoever seeks reputation, whoever wants to be famous in this world, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will expose them on the day of judgment. So this is a very serious thing. If you want fame in this world, then that's the risk you're taking that Allah will uh, humiliate you and expose you on the day of judgment to everybody. And we don't want that. We never want that. We want our intentions always to be pure for his sake. And we don't want fame because fame is quite dangerous. Okay. And here I'm going to explain pursuing fame. There's a phrase called chasing the carrot. Okay. Chasing the carrot is something that um, they used to do back in the days, these poor horses and animals, right? They would have to sometimes travel and do a lot of physical labor for human beings before we had cars and all of these other things. So they would, these owners would, got, you know, they thought, hmm, how can we get these mules and donkeys and horses to keep moving? Um, what, how, what incentive can we give them? What reward can we give them that will make them keep moving instead of stopping in their tracks and resting, right? So what they did is they would tie a carrot to a stick. And they would put it on the wagon or they would put it right here, like in this example, and it would hang in front of the poor donkey or the horse or the mule. And the animal doesn't know. It's thinking it's within reach because if it, something is hanging in front of you, naturally you think I'm going to walk towards it and then get it, right? So that's how they would trick these poor animals to keep working, keep working, keep working. But that phrase, chasing the carrot, also applies to fame that what the pursuit of fame is, it's like chasing a carrot. It's you're never gonna get the carrot. The poor animal never really got the carrot until the end, right? Maybe when they arrived, finally after miles and miles and miles, hours and hours, maybe they would get a carrot. But um, that's what fame is like, is that you work towards something that's never, you're never really gonna get. And you see a lot of people working so hard to be famous, but they end up actually destroying their relationships, losing a lot of money, 
And there's so many people who think like, you know, someone will come because there's something called being scammed, right? A lot of, there's a lot of scammers. Scammers are people who are very good at tricking people. So they come around and they'll tell you, oh, I'll make you famous and I'll make this for you and you'll get a show on TV and you'll be known by the world and you'll make millions and millions of dollars. Just give me $5,000 and I'll do that for you. So you think, wow, for $5,000, sure. If I'm gonna make millions and millions, I'll do it. And so you are innocent, right? You're pure hearted. And a lot of young people fall for these kinds of tricks because they don't have life experience, right? Unless they have parents and people who are teaching them these things, but some kids end up getting scammed a lot because of false promises. And so it's like this, it's like they're just making you chase that carrot but in actuality, you never get the reward that you that they promise you. And that's why it's sad because so many people end up getting hurt um, and losing a lot of things for fame. And so we never seek fame with people. We only seek to be known by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the treatment of Suma, like Riya, right, um, which is to show off, Suma enters the heart because of something called Ghafla. Ghafla in, is the Arabic word. It's actually a disease of the heart we're going to cover soon, but I'll just introduce it now. It's heedlessness. It's when you forget the priority, like what's more important. So when you have ghafla, it will lead to riya and suma, both of them, ostentation and wanting reputation, wanting people to hear about all of the good deeds that you were doing, okay? So um, heedlessness is where it starts. It's because you forget that Allah is more important than anything and anybody else. And as soon as you forget Allah, then you start thinking about fame and wanting to be popular and wanting to be known and uh, thinking that good is going to come from people. No good comes from people, right? No good. All good comes from who? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So don't give up or don't forget him because once you forget him, then other people are going to start taking you away and distracting you from him. So um, hiding your good deeds and not sharing them with people, similarly to, uh, to Riyah, right, is a really good way to prevent Suma from entering the heart, right? And again, um, this is a hadith, whoever displays his good deeds to others, Allah will display his bad deeds on the day of judgment. So, so important that we understand not to show off. So if you're memorizing, Quran, or you've got some knowledge, or you did something really nice, maybe you $50 of your sadaqah or your gift money, maybe grandma gave you a lot of money, and now you want to take some of it, and you want to give it to a charity, you don't go around and tell people those things. Keep your good deeds hidden. They're between you and Allah, and he doesn't need you to announce them. He already knows, right? And then know that no good can come to you from people, but all good is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you should seek to be famous with Allah, right? Seek fame through him, not through people, because people don't do anything for you. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you make him your number one priority, then he will exalt you, right? That ayah, that, that ayah that we talked about before, he will make you important to people because you made him important. And that's also a hadith. Whoever makes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala priority and puts in his pleasure before the people, Allah will be pleased with them and he will make the people pleased with them. So this is also a very important message. And the opposite, the hadith says that whoever makes, you know, the pleasure of people before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will not be pleased with them and the people will never be pleased with them. So if you put the making people happy before making Allah happy, nobody will be happy with you. There will always be haters, right? I'm sure you guys know that term, uh, who are always uh, saying negative things about you. So people will never be happy with you. And then Allah will also not be happy with you. So it's like you're the ultimate loser. Not a good plan, right? So Alhamdulillah. All right, you guys. So that is the final um, presentation for today. I'm opening it up now to questions. I'd love to hear from you guys. So I'm going to go ahead and stop. I'll come back here and you guys can see me now, right? So let's look at the Q&A and see what kind of questions we have. Any questions? Go ahead and let's, I know it's six o'clock, but I'll, t uh, I'll go a few more minutes because we had those interruptions. And we also added a disease today. So we went a little bit over, but I'm happy to answer any questions that you have, inshallah. 
Okay, anything at all? Oh, some of you have to leave. Okay, well, thank you for being here. Um, Salaamu Alaikum, Rahil and Ehsan. Thank you for coming. I know it's six o'clock, so you guys have to leave. But again, anybody else? I'm looking at the, uh, oh wait. Oh, you guys are on Q&A, oops. I'm on the chat. All right, let's see here. I was looking at the wrong thing. All right, give me just a second. Um, okay, I'm gonna get rid of these answers that you guys put here. Uh, someone's asking how many more classes do we have? We'll meet inshallah next week and we'll see on Thursday of next week if we need one more class, okay? Um, oh, okay, so some of you are unable to access the uh, chat, but that's okay. If you can't access the chat, message me on the Q&A. Um, I'm still going through. I just joined. How do you know if anyone comes talking to you? Um, okay, Bismillah. Can people see my questions? Your video is freezing. <laughs> you guys are so cute. Um, which one of the four diseases is the worst? Huh, Captain. I don't know who Captain is. Um, interesting name there. Asked which of the four diseases is the worst? Well, you know, all of them are bad. All the diseases are bad. But I think you have to really look at which one is affecting you, right? For each person, it's going to be different. For some people, you know, uh, we, we we likely, most of us have a lot of these diseases, right? It's something that we all have at different degrees. Some people have riya more than they have you know, displeasure with divine decree. So it really depends on each individual person to look inside their heart and go, man, maybe I have uh, suma. Maybe I, I do like for people to know my good deeds and I do have riya. Oh no, this is not good. And so you got to work on that, especially when we remember, right? Riya was what the Prophet told us. He was most worried about that for us because it's a form of shirk and shirk is the worst thing that you could ever do. It's one of the most, you know, it's the thing that Allah says he does not forgive to associate partners with him. So, you know, if you're asking me from all of these four, surely ostentation would be up there. But I think individually, it's going to differ from every single person. You have to look into your own heart to determine which one is really the worst for you. Okay. Um, okay, so we're at, getting a question about bribing. Does it mean when someone bribes someone that's ostentation because they're willing to bribe for their approval, better scores for some test rigging competition? I mean, that's just fraud. You know, if you're uh, bribing people um, to basically get something that you didn't earn, that's fraud. That's, that's really bad. And yeah, if you're doing it because you want to show off um, and you want to act like you've earned something you didn't earn, then sure, it's all of those things, but that's a really terrible thing to do. Um, okay. Marshall, I'm getting really nice comments here. Uh, okay, so we're getting a question that says um, that harm can only come from Allah. What if someone has a gun? <laughs> well, okay, so let me explain. What we mean by that, of course, human beings are the ones that enact bad things on earth. Allah is not doing those things, right? However, it's by his permission that he allows us to do things, right? He's given us free will, right? So it's by his permission that human beings can act, right? So if he didn't give us permission to act good or bad, we wouldn't be able to do things. So when we say that it's by the will of Allah that something happens, that's what we're talking about. But the one who's doing the evil act, they're the ones who are causing the harm, not Allah. He's not causing it. It's the evil person with the gun who's doing that, right? And so, um, but even that, if you want, you know, protection uh, from something like that, you have to turn to Allah because he's the only one who can really protect you from those types of things. Is the Q&A a new thing? Um, it's a feature on this webinar, uh, yes. How about showing off to our family members? Maya, very good question. Yes, showing off in general is not a good thing. Whether it's to your family, to your friends, um, to your grandparents, it doesn't matter. It's a quality that you don't wanna have. Now, um, in getting encouragement is different, right? If you are starting something, let's say for the first time and you're just trying to get better at it and you like to be encouraged, 
then your parents or your teachers or the elders in your family, they should know that it's okay to maybe give you a little bit of attention in the beginning when you're starting off something, right? Like when you first start to pray or you first start to memorize Quran or you take a class or you're working on a talent, um, a skill, art, maybe a, an instrument you're doing or a sport that you're playing. It's perfectly fine for uh, you to maybe want a little bit of feedback, some validation, because you're just starting off, you're insecure, right? We're all insecure when we do something for the first time. We're not sure of ourselves. So sometimes you might want people to know that you did something like, you know, and you might share, but this is about making it a habit, right? If five years into something you're doing and you still like to brag about it, this is a disease of the heart, right? So you wanna make sure that you know the difference because encouragement from family members, like maybe you wanna share with grandma what you did or your aunt or uncle or someone, that's fine. But if you're doing it because you just like the attention and it makes you feel proud of yourself or you like to make your other uh, kids or that, you, that are your age feel less than compared to you, this is when it's definitely Ria, so I would say watch out. It's a disease of the heart. And remember, it's like that sneaky, sneaky ant, right? That little black ant, it can crawl up on you. So you want to be very careful, okay? To not let it um, enter your heart. Um, okay, should you still try to learn from knowledgeable person? Very good question. Should you still try to learn from a knowledgeable person who doesn't have good intentions? Now, I'm not sure who, uh, how you would know what their intentions are, but if their intentions are bad, you shouldn't learn from them, okay? Um, you should try to seek out, I mean, if they make their intentions bad to you, you should definitely not, you should stay away from people like that um, because they're, that's not good that, to encourage them. Uh, we would say this is enabling, right? If you see a Muslim who's doing something they shouldn't be doing, if you look over it, like you gloss over it, like, oh, okay, I'll, it's not a big deal, or okay, I'll just go along with it, then you can, you're kind of enabling them to do that. But if you say, wait a second, but that's not a good intention, you shouldn't do that, that's haram, that's wrong, then you're reminding them also, so you're protecting them, you don't want them to be in trouble with Allah, right? So I would say if they make their intentions known to you that they're not good intentions, then don't enable them, make the offer them, guide them in a good way, and look for maybe a teacher who's got really good intentions, inshallah. But if you're thinking that their intentions aren't good, that's suspicion. And you shouldn't have suspicion from uh, because you don't know what's in someone's heart. So unless they tell you that their intentions aren't good, don't go by what your suspicions are. That's not right. Okay? All right. Oh, I have someone who said, I love your classes. Well, thank you, anonymous attendee. I love you too. <laughs> and I love doing these classes. So sweet. Um, yes, the Google form you can get for signing up for this class on the MCC uh, Facebook page, website. You'll see it there, inshallah. So please check that. Um, what if you're doing something for the sake of Allah, but you also want a little attention? You know what, Soha, that's a good, I hope I answered that in the previous question. Wanting a little bit of attention for, um, you know, just to feel, like I said, encouraged is good, but don't get dependent on that because it will become a habit. And now you're not even sure, am I doing it for Allah anymore or for I'm doing it for the attention? But if you just, in the beginning of trying something new, like I said, you just want to get kind of used to it and comfortable with it, that's okay. But pull back as soon as you start seeing that you're doing it, that that's the first thought that comes to your mind. Ooh, someone will notice me. Ooh, I hope they know that I got, you know, a really good test score and that I'm going to, you know, that my teacher was, you know, or I got a award at school. I hope my mom tells them. And I hope, you know, my dad says this about me that I won my soccer game. You like, you want people to hear all the stuff that, you know, that, that, that where they're bragging about you. That means that you like the attention too much, right? And so you shouldn't do that. You should say, you know what? Allah knows everything. And as long as he knows and he's happy with me, that's all that matters to me. And I'm not going to um, build my self image based on what people think, because people are always, there's always going to be some people who come and they'll have something to complain about. It's like, you'll never really satisfy people. Whereas Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, just by doing something with the right intention, um, he is already happy with you, right? And so that's why making sure that we please Allah before anybody else is so much better than wasting your time trying to make people happy because there are always going to be those people that are not really ever happy with you. 
Aw, thank you, Kinza. You're so sweet. You guys are so sweet that you're asking, uh, giving me all these lovely compliments. Jazakallah khair, and may Allah reward you guys for making the time to be here. That's a great honor for me to teach you. Um, so how do you know if Allah is talking to you? Very good question. So obviously, you know, we are in this world and Allah, uh, when, he, when we say that Allah communicates to us certain things, it's not like the way a human is talking to us where we actually are talking to them, but rather it's inspiration. This is called khawat, that it's a, it's a feeling that you get. And so whenever you're uh, uh, feeling to do really good things, where you're feeling like you should be doing worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you're getting or getting really good dreams that are, you know, some people are dreaming about amazing things like the Kaaba or they see the Prophet to them. Those things are gifts from Allah. So there, that's a form of communication that Allah is, is speaking to us, right? So you have to listen to your heart. But anytime you are being drawn closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is a way where Allah is speaking to us, inshallah, through the khawatik, through that inspiration, that, that uh, you know, telling you to get up and do something, go read the Quran, right? Go pray extra prayers, those extra ibadah that we do. And we do them in secrecy. We do them for Allah. Those are all ways that Allah is drawing us close to him, alhamdulillah. So thank you for that lovely question. Um, and then, is complaining the same as a displeasure with the divine decree? Excellent question, Bilal. Thank you. What a great question. Complaining to Allah is perfectly fine, okay? Because he's the only one that is in control, right? So it makes sense if something happened and you're not necessarily happy about it. Let's say, for example, you have a pet, okay? I used to have a, I mean, I've had pets before, but I used to have a pet that I loved. She was very special to me and I lost her under a very difficult situation. I won't go into the details because we don't have time, but the way that I lost her was hard for me, right? But I had to accept it the way whatever happened, it happened and let go, right? Um, but my pain that I was feeling, I, you can't just turn it off and on. We're human beings, right? It's not like a switch. So you take that pain and instead of being angry that it happened, right? Like, why did I have to lose her? You say, Ya Allah, my heart hurts, but I'm patient with your decree. I have trust in you. And then you keep remembering that this world is, you know, only for a short time. The next world is forever. And in the next world, Allah will give us whatever we want. So yeah, my dua is that I will be inshallah reunited with my beloved Juju in Jannah. You know, I lost her in this world. It was, you know, not a good situation, but I accepted it that it was, it happened, uh, not by my planning, certainly. But my hope in Allah is that he will reward me for my patience and then give me her in Jannah. And that's where you take your complaint. You, you can certainly not always be happy with something that happens that Allah wills, but it's that beautiful patience that says, oh Allah, this is painful for me, but I love you more than this thing. And I will never lose hope in you. That is true Iman. And so do that. Always remember, Allah never puts you through something for without a reason. So even if you're being tested with some difficulty, that there is always a greater meaning to it. Have sabrun jameel with Allah and watch what will happen. He will replace uh, your loss or your pain and he will increase you in blessing and he will remove that pain and distance you from that pain, inshallah, because of your beautiful patience. But the opposite, if you just become grumpy and upset and angry and you have displeasure with the divine decree, this is all from Iblis because he wants you to be stuck in bad feelings all the time and depressed and angry. That's not from, from our tradition. And uh, alhamdulillah, we're, we're Muslim and we have, we have belief in our Lord, right? Okay, so I think I've answered all of your questions. We have gone over 15 minutes. Oh man, I'm so sorry. But thank you to all of you for your, um, oh, it was a cat. My pet was a cat. Um, that's who I lost, my, my cat Juju. Um, but thank you all for your amazing questions. I'm sorry for the screen issues that we had, but thank you for your patience. Next uh, Tuesday, we'll come back for week three, more diseases of the heart to cover. Um, and I'm uh, looking forward to that. Inshallah, remember to study and go over your notes because there will be a quiz. 
inshallah, and I, I look forward to seeing you guys then. Thank you so much and have a wonderful iftar. Keep us in your du'as, okay? Make du'a for me and my family and everybody at MCC for making these classes possible. Sister Homera, who's also um, here uh, facilitating, make du'a for her and her family, all right?